is going to begin slightly differently this morning um, and is probably a slightly different message than I kind of thought this, uh, I would bring from this passage. But uh, with uh, COP26 going on right now in Glasgow, I thought it was appropriate to address some of the things that uh, we're thinking about or they're thinking about from uh, our Bible passage here today. But uh, in front of you, you, sh you should have a, qu a quiz here, which I hope you've given just a few minutes uh, to give a go. If you're online and it hasn't come through, I apologize, um, but we'll try and guide you through some of the, some of the questions here. And this is, these are all related to, um, uh, to creation and the circumstances that uh, are perceived to be going on in the world right now. So the first question here, the amount of water needed to grow cotton for and for the manufacture of one pair of jeans is equal to the amount of water the average person consumes in, and you have an option of a month, one year, one month, one year, or 10 years. So that's your A, B, and C choices. So um, who, who votes for the, for the one month? Any hands up for a month? Okay, we've got a few, few hands out for one month. Who thinks maybe for a year that the amount... So you're wearing a pair of jeans there. How much water has been used to, to make that? Uh, or 10 years. Anybody go for 10 years? We've got some, some 10 years uh, votes here. The answer is, in fact, 10 years. It's 1,800 gallons of water are apparently used to produce enough crop for one pair of jeans and then to process it and dye it and produce it for us. And so uh, it, on, the, on the basis of, of the average person across the planet, uh, drinking water is only about two or three liters per day. Uh, that kind of computes to 10 years worth. So next time you buy a pair of jeans from Primark for 14 quid or whatever it is, just think about actually the amount of resources that's being expended there for their production. Second question, what proportion of the world's food is wasted, i.e. not picked, spoiled on the way to the market, binned by shops, cafes, or homes? Is it A, 10%, B, 30%, or C, 50%? So what do we think? 10%, any hands up for 10%? 10% wastage of food? Okay, I think we're all thinking upstairs at least here. It might be more than that. Okay, anyone go for 30%? Got quite a few hands up there for 30%. How about 50%? Got some 50%. Well, the 50% is a little bit pessimistic. It is, in fact, 30%. So, so about a third, but this is still an astonishing thing if we think about it, that about a third of all the food that is prepared across the world doesn't actually kind of get consumed, it gets spoiled along the way, um, rots or doesn't get used in the end and so on. So that, there's a, a, a phenomenal amount of waste going on and I dare say that that wastage is geared towards the um, west rather than, um, uh, than the east or the, or the south in terms of the world. Okay, question three. Using a global average, how much has sea level risen since 1900? Has the sea level risen? Do you think it may have risen A, 2.1 centimetres, B, 21 centimetres, or C, 41 centimetres? So, so we've either got two centimetres, about this much, 21 centimetres, about eight inches, or, or 41 centimetres, which would be about this much, a foot and a bit. So what do we think? A. Any hands up for A? One or two for A, 2.1 centimetres. Any Bs, 21 centimetres? You've got a few hands up here. I can't see hands up downstairs yet. I haven't got x-ray specs on. Uh, 41 centimetres. A few with 41 centimetres. The actual answer here is is B, 21 centimetres. So sea level has risen uh, so far, you know, across, if you think about that being on the average across the globe, that is a phenomenal amount of water. If you think about the size of the oceans and the planet, um, 21 centimetres is, is a rise, isn't it? 
Um, question four, what proportion of those living with at least moderate flood risk live in low to middle income countries in the southern hemisphere? So these are people whose, whose uh, uh, living conditions puts them in at least moderate flood risk in low to middle countries in the southern hemisphere. Is, is it A, 50% of those peoples in the southern hemisphere? Is it B, 75% or C, 90%? So what do we think? 50%? So a good half of those people perhaps in danger of sea level rise and so on, 50%? 75%? Any takers for someone got 75%? That would be three quarters of people or C, 90%. Astonishingly, the answer is 90%. So think about that, that in the southern hemisphere, 90% of, of the populations are living with at least moderate flood risk. So that is quite a big catch-all, isn't it? Moderate flood risk. But that means that there is a flood risk. Um, so uh, that is probably a bit of a play on, on words there to get the biggest percentage uh, there, isn't it? Okay, uh, question five. A train traveling from Paris to Toulouse, which is 420 miles, generates on average six kilograms of carbon dioxide per passenger. A person making the same journey on their own by car would create A, 16 kilograms of CO2, B, 66 kilograms of CO2, or C, 116 kilograms of CO2. So apparently um, Paris to Toulouse is a very popular route and lots of people make that, uh, that journey by train uh, every day of the, the, the week. What do we think? A, 16 kilograms car journey, B, 66 kilograms, or C, 116 kilograms. 420 miles, 116 kilograms. Got, got one or two takers for that. It is, in fact, C, 116 kilograms. So, you know, there is, there is a difference in impact in the environment, isn't there, by, by combining journeys with others on a train um, versus uh, making that uh, journey by car. That is, there is about, uh, that is about a 20 times difference there. So we should be aware of such things, shouldn't we? If you were to do it by plane, it would be 168 kilograms, apparently. And even that is with shared passengers across an aircraft. So uh, that's not like one person in one plane. So, um, yeah, think about, think about that as we, as we perhaps travel. Question six. Which country is currently the biggest generator of solar power? Is it A, Australia? In that hot, sunny climb down there, is it B, China, or is it C, the USA? What do we think? Any, any voters for Australia? We've got some votes for Australia there. Quite a few, actually. We've got B, China. We've got some votes for China. And C, USA. What do we think? No one's voting for the USA. We, we kind of know they're behind the curve, don't we? The answer is, in fact, B, China. So China, interestingly, has 35% of all the solar power generated in the world. 35% of all solar power is generated in China. And yet, that only produces 2% of all the power that China needs or uses. That shows you some of the challenge there, doesn't it? So if you think about all the solar power that we see kind of going out there in big fields and on people's roofs, you drive through Germany, you see these big farms with, with all these panels on top, and it's amazing to see how much there is in some areas in Germany and across in, in Europe. And yet China has the most, and yet it only supplies 2% of all that they need. You think about how much land there would need to be covered in solar panels if it was really to produce everything. You know, that has an ecological impact in itself, I would have thought. Question seven. Uh, in 1980, the annual minimum extent of the Arctic ice cap was three million square miles. So 1980, 40 years ago, 
in 2019, this figure was A, 2.6 million, B, 2 million, or C, 1.6 million. So this is a reduction to a smaller size of square miles of ice, Arctic ice cap. Who goes for 2.6 million? Reduction of 0.4 million. Okay. Who goes for 2 million? That would be a reduction of a third, wouldn't it? Okay, the answer is in fact 1.6 million. So it, the Arctic ice cap has shrunk by a half in 40 years in terms of its square miles. I couldn't tell you about the, the thickness of it, but that is a measure of square mileage, and I'm, you know, take it from there. Interesting, isn't it? In question eight, in 2019, the world lost the equivalent of one football pitch of primary rainforest every A, six seconds, B, six hours, or C, six days. So a football pitch. So we've got a couple of football pitches out there. I think, I think, I think that would be perhaps a couple of pitches sizes out there, you know, but how often, how, how quickly is that lost? A, six seconds, any hands for that? B, six hours? And six hours or C, six days. So we had some A's and some B's there. The, the sad answer is A, every six seconds, which is, which is crazy, isn't it, when we think about it? So um, there's huge amounts of ongoing uh, deforestation, especially in, in uh, South America, uh, Indonesia, and places. Question nine, which of these places has warmed the most over the past century? Is it A, Basra in Iraq? Is it B, Vancouver in Canada? Or C, Svalbard in Norway? So what do we think? The place that's warmed the most, Basra in Iraq? It's a kind of hot place anyway. No, no voters upstairs for that. Vancouver in Canada? Got some voters for that. Or Svalbard in Norway? We've got some voters for that. The answer is C, Svalbard in Norway. So Basra's uh, 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 temperature has warmed by 1.8 degrees and Svalbard, Norway, by 2.7 degrees on average in that time. So I think there's, a, there's an increasing impact in, in, the, in the northern hemispheres and probably then down also equivalent in the southern hemispheres rather than in central regions. Okay, last question here. What proportion of the UK land surface is covered by buildings such as houses, shops, offices, factories, greenhouses, and so on? Is it A, 41.4%, B, 21.4%, or C, 1.4%? So uh, any voters for the 40%? Some of you think we live in a very, very industrialized landscape. 40%. Anyone 21%? We've got some voters for 21%. Anyone 1.4%? David here, 1.4%. The answer is, in fact, 1.4%. We, we perceive that we're in more of an urban environment than, in fact, we are. So uh, that doesn't mean that all of that land can be lived on, of course, but it does mean that the vast majority of the UK is not concreted over, thankfully. Uh, there is some space, isn't there? But there's some interesting, I, I would I'd like to uh, attribute this to Whitcomb Baptist Church had a creation care evening and I came across this little quiz that they did there and I thought that was excellent and it would be worth just doing, just to, and you know, for us to be interested because I'm thinking this morning about this question of is planet Earth in crisis? And, um, you know, as we know, there, are some, there is some debate to that. But I think, as we see by some of those statistics there, self-evidently, there are some big things going on. And we need to play our part in being uh, the solution uh, or part of the solution there or not contributing uh, to the problem there if we can avoid it. We'll be thinking about this a little bit this morning. So, as we know, um, people are meeting for COP26 right now, aren't they? And they're meeting to address a range of 
ecological issues that are facing the earth. And those ecological issues are, um, are, are, are some of these. Let me just set this to record. So at COP26, they're, uh, they're meeting to address a, a range of ecological issues, climate change, global warming, deforestation, loss of habitat, uh, extinction of animals, insects in particular of concern, rising sea levels, retreating glaciers and ice flows, plastic pollution in the oceans, loss of fresh water, uh, to name just a few of the major issues facing the modern world. And there's a, there's a feverish kind of activity uh, and concern going on. I think we can, we can all get the sense of that from the newspapers and the media. But Christians, I'm not saying that we shouldn't respond positively to some of these things, but Christians need to be discerning if we're to think rightly and respond appropriately to some of these things. Because as with many things in life, there are extreme positions. And if you end up in an extreme position, um, you can find yourself doing something that, that is extreme. I just happened to catch a, 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 a little news clip yesterday evening. Uh, some pub somewhere in the UK wanted to uh, have um, a reindeer you know, there on the kind of pub lawn for Christmas so that kids can come and have a bit of fun and feed it a carrot and so on. And those who are, uh, object to animals being used with indignity like that have apparently, you know, sent 400-odd emails to this pub threatening to burn it down. Well, goodness me, it seems to me that that is an extreme reaction to... Uh, someone wanting to do something fairly light-hearted, and I'm sure it's not going to be of harm to uh, the certain reindeer there. I mean, notwithstanding, you know, it's all a nonsense, isn't it, in Christmas and Santa and reindeers and all of that. But, you know, it's pretty harmless in the big scheme of things. And here's people going to extremes and threatening to burn, burn people down to destroy their livelihoods and, and so on. It's, it's weird, isn't it, the world that we live in? So, you know, on the one hand, as we think about climate change and our duty for care over the environment, and this is what we have in Genesis chapter 1, isn't it? On the one hand, it does seem as we look out across the world that the scale of industrialization and exploitation of the planet's resources is having an increasingly harmful impact on the natural world and our environment. There seems to be almost no question about that. Whether it can all be traced back to, to what man has done is in some places part of the debate, but I think it's inevitable to see uh, from the scale of what we're doing that it is having a harmful in, impact on our environment. On the other hand, we need to be mindful that there are extreme aspects to the message and that most of the voices that are in the media and, and that are involved in the, day, the, the, the debate have no understanding of the things of God. They're not rooted in biblical ideas. They're not rooted sometimes even in proven scientific ideas. And therefore they're conclusions, their thinking and their conclusions could well be well-intentioned, but also wrong. And they're, and, they're, and they're in danger of leaving people in despair and without hope, because the message, if people don't change in terms of their relationship to the earth and the environment and the resources that, that we're using, if they don't change, the message is one of, of bleak Despair, isn't it? There's no hope in their schema of things. So this morning, I believe our passage reminds us of certain things that we need to get right. And, and here is the first, that firstly, the Bible declares that the earth is the Lord's, isn't it? Here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, that he had made. And, and this is the, the culminating statement, isn't it? At the end of the six days of, of his creative work. He surveyed everything that he had made. 
that it, it, the, the world is what he has made. It's not what we have made, is it? Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness, or in everything in it, the world and those who dwell therein. Colossians says, as we picked up a few weeks ago, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist or are upheld. And so the foundation of Christian thinking about the earth and our place in it, the foundation upon which everything is built for Christians is that the earth, this world, our lives, everything around us belongs to God. We didn't make the world, did we? God made it all, and every aspect of creation is intended to bring glory to God. You know, God can bring glory from, from, the, from the trees as they change their colors in the seasons, from the, from the air, from the, from, the, from the way that clouds work. It's a, it's a miracle in the Psalms, pick up on the miracle of God bringing rain. We don't think about it too much, but the very fact that God causes evaporation from the oceans, which takes the salt out and then transports uh, water across thousands of miles in order for it to drop as raindrops, freshwater raindrops, and not just dumped. Of course, we see that sometimes, don't we, in heavy rain, but, but to bring the water to the land where it's needed, that is a miracle and a wonder which we take for granted, and it brings glory to God. Despite what the smooth-talking astronomer Brian Cox says, the world is not here by cosmic accident, is it? And despite what David Attenborough says, life in all its complexity did not arise by chance. In that sense, the world does not belong to us. It's not our world. Neither is it our planet, as if we are ultimate master over it. We're not, are we? As we saw previously, everything has been made for the glory of God, from trees and rivers and mountains to seas and skies, and all that fills it, every part of creation, is there to give glory to God in some measure, according to its purpose within creation, and therefore we have a stewardship responsibility over it. But this means in itself, and I don't know if you do much reading, but there's whole beliefs out there about Gaia. Have you heard about Gaia as a theory? If you haven't, then inform yourself. But it's the kind of belief that there is, the earth is, is like a superorganism, and it will ultimately fight back to establish balance uh, in, uh, you know, across the world. Well, that's really just a form of, of paganism, isn't it? You know, if you're going to, if you're going to marry ecological issues with, with ideas about that, then, then your, your foundation thinking is, is wrong, isn't it? This is, is paganism, it's at best naturalism or spiritism with some kind of mystic metaphysical conscience that the earth supposedly has. You know, again, we might use the, the uh, language of Mother Nature, and we understand what's meant by the phrase Mother Nature, don't we? But in reality, is there such a thing as Mother Nature? There isn't, really. The Bible doesn't actually have a word for nature, interestingly. It's just creation. It's God's creation. It's interesting that there is no uh, Hebrew word for, for nature. What there is, is a world that is God's creation, that he spoke and brought into existence, and that he made every part of it, and he has put in place all the powers that, that hold it in balance in the world. And whilst we know that God uses natural processes in the world to shape the current world, nevertheless, the truth is we continue to exist because God ultimately upholds creation and works all things according to his sovereign will. Now, that doesn't mean that, that suffering and troubles in the world are caused by God. They can be the effect of our actions, can't they? We may well reap what we sow in our actions. In fact, we see that as a principle. It's just a spiritual principle that we reap what we sow. If you, if you sow bitterness, you're going to reap bitterness back, aren't, aren't you? And, um, but ultimately, we can't go beyond the sovereignty of God's ultimate control over everything. We read 
here in Genesis 1, that God exercised his power to bring creation into existence, and he being the creator has the divine right to end it too. Wars and famines and pestilences and earthquakes and natural disasters, they may well be the consequences of our actions in that as sinners we reap what we sow, but ultimately the power over all things remains in God's hands and not man's. Mankind is set over creation, isn't he? Genesis 1.26, given dominion. But that over creation is still under God, isn't it? God is sovereign. And so if, if people come up with ideas that put mankind at the center of everything, it's wrong. If people put, make, come up with ideas which puts ecology and nature at the center of, of everything, that's not right either, because it is God alone who is at the center of everything. The world wouldn't exist without God, so he must be at the center of everything. It's like thinking of the solar system without the sun at the center of it. It just doesn't work, does it? And so God is at the center of everything. And this helps us to discern the true nature of the problem. Because the consequences being played out across the planet flow from the spiritual problem in the heart of man, don't they? So if we're being told that we need to respond to an ecological situation, and that that, that is more important than anything and everything else, then that is a, an extreme position. Now, I'm not saying that we, should, that we should pollute the seas with plastic. No, we shouldn't do that. But that is not the ultimate issue, is it, that needs to be faced. If we're to say that if only we were to, to solve that, then the world would be right. If we were to solve this problem, that problem, this problem, that problem, would the world be right? No, it wouldn't be, because, because it's the heart of man that's wrong. And, and the, the issues that we see in ecology around us flow out from, from greed and rebellion and ignorance in the heart of mankind, don't they? When If we were to, to think about how God sees mankind in relation to the world around us, he says, you are of more value than sparrows. And that's comforting to know, isn't it? That even though everything is, is about God, yet God still sees mankind, even in his sin, as being precious in his sight. So the earth is the Lord's. This is, this is the foundation stone that we begin with, doesn't it? It's not, it's not man's. It's not nature's own. Nature is, a, is, is what God has made. It's creation. It all belongs to him, primarily, when we keep drilling down to the starting point. Secondly here, man's dominion was intended for good. God had made mankind and set him with dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and to fill it and subdue it and so on. And ultimately, at the conclusion of it all, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. It wasn't just good, it was very good. And this statement made after mankind was made means that God's intentions through mankind's role in creation was good. He can't say, say uh, he have made man, given him dominion, and, and his place in this is going to be evil. Now, that, that may be what's come about because of the fall, but man's original intention through, God's original intention through man's dominion, we must read here, is for good. In fact, in context here, we see harmony, don't we, between all of original creation. In verse 30, we read that there's no predation of one animal upon another. The food for all the animals was vegetation, wasn't it? Animals didn't therefore live in fear of one another. All was peaceful between the creatures of the earth and therefore also between mankind and the creatures of the earth too. Mankind, we note, is originally vegetarian was to share the same food with the animals. And so God filled the earth, didn't he, with trees and an abundance of fruits and grains and nuts and seeds and vegetables and roots and so on for our food. We read that, chapter 1, verse 29. In fact, it's, it's only after the flood 
that the Bible says the fear of man and the dread of man would come upon the animals. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 2, at which point man is given a concession that he can eat those animals. Chapter 9 and verse 2, if you wanted to look ahead and, and those verses there. So, of course, as we look back here, there was harmony between all of creation and harmony between man and God too in the original creation. And to modern man, you know, with his kind of constructed evolutionary history, which we looked at over a couple of weeks ago, this may seem a strange starting point. But we hold on to these things as being historically true and are therefore the original reality because to hold on to any other view is to found your ideas upon error. As we saw at the beginning, the, the things that God, how God made things in the beginning with peace and harmony is how he's going to bring them to conclusion at the end in the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's a connection between these things. Mankind, mankind, we're told he was given dominion over all the creatures of the world in order to fill the earth and subdue it. But this was not intended for harm, but for good. And so perhaps the best English term we can use for this responsibility would be the word stewardship. You know, I think for dominion, we, we might extrapolate the word dominion and misapply it. It would be good to think of that dominion as stewardship under God. A kind of rulership, yes, but a responsibility that goes along, along with it to manage the resources which belong to another, because it belongs to God, remember, but for the benefit of all. We're stewards of the earth and its creatures and its resources, and I believe we will give account to God for that. God gave man, that God gave man dominion is not an excuse to destroy, is it? Or to use with reckless abandon, to be wasteful. You know, is God for wastefulness or against wastefulness? He, he's against wastefulness, isn't he? He is, he is for the, the, the proper stewardship of resources, isn't he? The rule that mankind is to exercise was to reflect God's own rule, wasn't it? Of course it was. As his image bearers within the world. And, and how is it that God rules? Well, God rules with justice. He rules with equity, doesn't he? He rules for the, for the ultimate good of all. He makes his rain shine, rain shine, the sun shine and his rain pour on the good and the evil alike. He is, he is equitable to all, good to all. And so mankind's role was intended to be for good as well. But this aspect of dominion has been misunderstood and misapplied by Christians and non-Christians alike, I think. Back in the 1960s, there was a writer I came across recently um, called Lynn Townsend White. And he blamed the Christian understanding of dominion as the source of the problems of the modern world. This is what he said. We shall, quote, we shall continue to have a worsening ecological crisis until we reject the Christian axiom that nature has no reason for its existence to serve man. Now, is he right or wrong in saying this? If we believe that the natural world is simply there to serve man, then you can see why we've ended up in the mess that we have ended up in, exploiting the world's resources only for our own benefit and to satisfy our, our endless greed. But is that the Christian viewpoint? Is that what dominion means? Is that how we're to exercise dominion? I don't believe it is. You know, surely this is a distorted view of what Christians believe. And we need to reclaim that biblical view and the glory of God at the center of anything and mankind's dominion being one of good stewardship as God intended if we're going to have a kind of voice to our community around us, that, that, that Christians aren't, aren't just seen as part of the problem but as part of the solution. I think we've all heard of Katie Hopkins, who, who is very vociferous on the English kind of landscape. Well, I think there's a kind of equivalent of her 
called Anne Coulter, C-O-U-L-T-E-R, who is an influential and outspoken Christian. I don't think Katie Hopkins would go marry up with Christian, but maybe she takes on some views and things. But, but anyway, in, in, in the U.S., American evangelical media, and Tony Parton might know more about her than, than me, I don't know. This Ann Coulter is quite influential. You know, they have all their kind of cable TV channels and so on, you know, Fox News and all of that kind of thing. And it's, it, 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 some of her views, it seems like, have percolated American thinking. You know, we find it strange, don't we, over this side of the pond to, to think that Christianity equals Bible in one hand and gun in the other. But in America, that kind of joins up and makes sense in, because of their history and their culture and the way they kind of read the Bible and so on. This is what Ann Coulter says about the Christian view of dominion. The ethic of conservation is the explicit renunciation of man's dominion over the earth. The lower species are here for our use. God said so. Go forth, be fruitful, multiply, and rape the planet. It's yours. That's your job, drilling, mining, stripping. Big gas-guzzling cars with phones and CD players and wet bars. That's kind of, you know, bars with drinks cabinets in your car. That's the biblical view. That's the biblical view? These are influential people on the, on the media scene. Well, I, sorry, I don't recognize that as being a biblical view. That, that's just greed and arrogance dressed up in biblical language, isn't it? If unbelievers, though, think that is what, what Christians believe and hold on to by this term dominion, it's no wonder that they write uh, such things as the following. So I'm going to read to you, with your permission, um, uh, an introduction in this Letters to Planet Earth. I mentioned this before and brought it before, and we didn't get, I didn't get to read it. But I, I feel I want to read this to you. So this book uh, is edited by Emma Thompson, the actor. It came out in 2020. It's called Letters to the Earth. I bought it because they talked about it on the radio, and I just wanted to get an insight into, as it were, the people's thinking in the current ecological crisis. And this two pages here, I'm just going to read to you. And there's so many things in this that, that I would respond to, and I, and I haven't got time to. It begins, dear author of Genesis, I know that it's pointless to begin like this because you lived about 3,000 years ago and are no longer around to answer my questions. But I think you would appreciate what I'm doing in this letter, so I'll carry on. You were a creative writer, an artist, and writers play around with words in ways that non-writers don't always understand. It is the way you have been misunderstood that bothers me. In fact, not understanding you has brought the world you wrote about so lovingly to a moment of great danger, a danger I want to tell you about. You started with these words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's how your book got its name, Genesis, beginning. Then you went on to craft a great poem describing how God made everything in six days and rested on the seventh. That's where the trouble started. I wish you had added a little note inviting a reader to take you seriously, but not literally. I've got problems here with this, obviously. In fact, I wish you had written a prologue in the art of reading. I wish you had reminded us that you were an artist responding imaginatively to the wonder of the universe, not a reporter taking notes on something happening in real time. But that's how some people started to read you, not as a glorious fiction that prompted their wonder, but as an accurate news report of a tumultuous week about 6,000 years ago. You won't believe this, but there are people alive in my time who insist on reading you that way. We could dismiss them all as endearing eccentrics if it weren't for something else they get wrong, something again they take literally, and, that, and this time it's had consequences, very serious consequences. On the sixth or last day of your narrative, God creates all the living creatures on earth and the grand, grand climax being the emergence of humanity, God's special favorite. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then came the fateful instructions to these human beings about how they are supposed to live. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. I want to pause for a moment to reflect on what you thought you were doing when these words came to you. Great writers don't tell us about something. Their writing becomes the thing itself. Is that what you were doing here? Were you writing with a premonitory sorrow over the meaning of these words? In a single sentence, you captured humanity's arrogance, its belief that it owned or had dominion over the earth and could do anything with it it liked. And that's what we have done. The planet is marked with the smudge of, our, of ugliness, of our abuse of it, is littered with the debris of our greed. To be fair to us, or some of us, we've begun to realize that we are, what we've done to the planet in our arrogance, and we're trying to make amends. We've now started cleaning up the rivers we polluted. We're trying to purify the air over our cities we've saturated with toxic particles. We're beginning to worry about the effect of losing, losing species we've re rendered extinct. But now some of us are beginning to wonder if it might be a little too late. A bit like deciding to spring clean a house on the edge of a cliff that's about to plunge into the sea because of coastal erosion. It's the earth, our home. That's now on the edge of the cliff. All because we didn't know how to read what you had written. Because we read your words not as a warning, not as a fable that required interpretation, but as an instruction manual to be followed to the letter. Look where it's got us. It gets worse. There are literates out there who believe this is what God actually wants. And because they don't know how to read, they've come up with a God who hates the world so much, he's coming soon to destroy it and everything in it. Except them, of course. They'll be saved as the planet combusts. That's why they welcome its extinction. Use it before you lose it. The end is nigh, they yell, believing their divinely chartered spaceship is standing by to take them to safety. How could I sum up their attitude for you, dear author of Genesis? expletive, the planet, we're going to be okay, is probably as close as I can get. So I hope you understand why I'm writing to you. It's not that I wish you'd been a bit more careful about how you wrote your parable, it's just I wish you'd made it clearer what you were doing when you started composing your great fiction. On the other hand, it's hardly your fault there are so many humans who completely lack imagination. But why do so many of them claim to be religious? Don't they understand that religion is the oldest art and that its stories are to be read seriously but not literally enough already? The good news is that young people everywhere are rebelling against humanity's God-given right to destroy the earth, their home. Their religion is love of the little blue planet that bore them and sustains them. And they are fighting hard to save it. You'd admire them. You'd want to write something to help them. Or maybe you would just point them to something another writer from your own family of artists would say hundreds of years later. His name was Isaiah, and this is what he wrote. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And you know what, old friend? I'm tempted to read that poem literally. This is by Richard Holloway. Ah. Oh, there are so many things to respond to in that, in terms of wrong thinking. I mean, there's some, there's some right critiquing going on there. You know, if that's what Christians believe, that dominion means we can just rape the planet, exploit it to, our, to whatever, pollute, destroy, it doesn't matter, then, then that's clearly wrong. Uh, clearly, that viewpoint has, has informed culture, and culture has become adrift from true Christianity and holds on to some of this as if it's just ours to exploit. Um, I, I hear his sentiment, I hear his concern. I'd love to have a conversation with him. I don't think it would get too far. But, you know, that is not, I mean, that is not surely the Christian viewpoint. It can't be. The Christian viewpoint is that this is God's world. Mankind's dominion over it was to be intended for good. We're, we're stewards of this world. And we're not here to plunder planet Earth, but to make use of its resources, which God gives to us to, to use carefully, um, wisely, for, for the good of mankind, not just for our own greed. And so Christian living and good Christian thinking needs to be a part of the solution and not the problem, because as God has established our dominion for good. So my, my closing point here is God's good end for mankind and earth. This is what, I mean, he quoted at the end there, but he has no idea 
how God is going to bring that wolf dwelling with the lamb into existence, as it were. Bearing these things in mind, it's evident, isn't it, that creation around us now is no longer the perfect, harmonious creation that we read in chapters 1 and 2. That's because we know what happens in chapter 3, that mankind is corrupted, that the earth itself, we read, is cursed, and it is blighted, chapter 3, verse 17. And we, we, we believe that the whole crea creation was affected and subjected to futility, is the language Paul uses in Romans 8, 19. The, church, the early church fathers, they held that the pain that we are made to see and experience in creation around us was intended to mirror back to us the impact of our own consequences, of the consequences of our own sins. So in the early church fathers' writing, it's like when, when you see brutality in the world, when you see earthquakes and famines and disease and and, you know, cows born with two heads or something that, that shocks you and, 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 and it's horrific, it's, it's, it's supposed to reflect back to us that now we, we live in a fallen world and, and man, this is your fault. This is the blight that's come upon creation on account of your rebellion. And so now we understand that we live in a fallen world and a failing world, don't we? And ultimately creation is beyond our ability to redeem it. The, the restoration which people are wanting to drive to is only ever a partial restoration. It's only God who can bring about the kind of restoration that is really needed of the wolf dwelling with the lamb and of them not hurting in all my holy mountain, as, as Isaiah 11 says. And so we read, don't we, that mankind brought death and decay into the world but now the whole creation groans, eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, Romans 8. The redemption, restoration, and regeneration of the world then is bound up with the redemption, restoration, and regeneration of mankind. And that is beyond our power to effect. It's not within a man to direct his next step, is what the Bible says, let alone to rescue the world from the troubles that it's facing. But the rest, redemption, restoration, and re regeneration of the world and mankind is God's great gospel plan, isn't it? Through his son. It remains the good end that he intends for the world, doesn't it? And... He wants us to know that hope through Christ and that there is hope for the individual and there is hope for the planet itself too in that Christian hope in Christ because in him dwells all fullness. And so despite the wrongdoing and misuse and exploitation and greed perpetrated in this world, God is at work, isn't he, to deliver a people from the greed and ruin of sin and promises a new world to come for his redeemed people. And this hope doesn't rest on the ability of man to change his ways, but in God who can change him. What does this mean for the present? Well, whatever mankind does in his own earthly wisdom seems to have limited effect and often unintended consequences. We try and cure one thing and then find that that makes another problem. And then in trying to cure that thing, that will make another problem. And we've got to be very wary of that in the modern world. Science seems to have answers, but actually it seems to produce a lot of the problems along the way itself. Why is this? It's because the power of sin pervades all aspects of man's nature. And so whilst we see the impacts of things we do, and can and should do what we can to reduce or mitigate those effects because we're good stewards, ultimately, the final outcome is beyond our control. For some, that leaves them in despair. You know, if the, if the, if the ecological message carries on as it, as it will do, people are going to be jumping off of bridges and taking their lives in desperation because 
of the, the troubles that are coming because in that message they have no hope, do they? But if we trust in God and no good's end, then despite the difficulties of the present, which we understand, we can have hope, can't we? Of course, it's right to try and be responsible to try, to, as in to you know, reduce our impact uh, on the earth. But the Bible is realistic in that we don't have the real power or ability to affect the kind of change that's needed. For the change that is needed is primarily in the human heart, isn't it? Which is full of greed and idolatry and rebellion and ignorance. In that sense, the ecological effects that the world is facing is the fruit of a spiritual problem, isn't it? That's what lies at the heart of the, thing, of the problem. And therefore, the gospel is the only true answer. Any answer that has no place for the gospel it, it is a false gospel. It's ultimately without hope, isn't it? If it's, got no, if it's got no salvation for mankind through Christ in it, how can it bring hope? So we may well have every sympathy for, for Greta Thunberg and, and, and her call to change, but we must not think that as she pictures it, that is the whole picture, because it is not. You can get sucked into something there which has despair built into it and no hope because it's rooted in mankind's ability to change. And even as she sees, that's all blah, blah, blah. People can't change. They have no power to change. They say they're going to change, but they still want to fly all around the world and produce their 116 kilograms or, or, of, of CO2 emissions per person per holiday or whatever. And we're not, we're not likely to change, you see. If that message, though, was coupled, coupled with a call to repentance and faith in the Creator, who entered mankind to save and deliver us from the destructive effects of our own sin, then the transformational changes needed might come about. For people to be converted is part of the solution, isn't it? Because only then are we really going to see our role of dominion in the right light and our responsibility as stewards in the right way. Let's not forget, as Christians, that we follow the one perfect man in the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Man. And of him, he said, when someone was setting out to follow him, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He had nothing, did he? The only thing he possessed at his very last moment was a tunic. And they took that from him and left him stripped naked, didn't they? And Jesus warns us about greed, about heaping up riches in the earth, and about not being rich towards God, and that our soul is so easy to be caught out in the day of accounting when we're not rich towards God. And we are reminded, aren't we, in the Bible that God has already caused Babel, Genesis chapter 10, to tumble once. And Revelation 19, Babylon is tottering, ready to fall in the world around us. And for Babylon, read New York and London and Paris and Tokyo and all civilizations built on man, as it were, reaching up to the heights. It's ripe to fall, isn't it? We're told not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And that's what we need to return to. We are, though, aren't we, to live as stewards of God's vineyard and to have a much lighter touch than we presently have and to remember that our dominion was intended for good. Let's hold on to that. Well, there's my thoughts for you. I'm sure there's, you know, there's 101 things we haven't touched on there, but I thought with this whole ecology thing on the go right now, our passage does address these things, doesn't it, in the, the way that we're thinking through creation and how it should shape our thoughts in the present. Let me bring our, our thoughts to close in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we've had this morning to think about your creation and our part and place in it. We thank you that you are sovereign over all the world and that despite 
mankind's problems. There is hope for us as individuals in and through Christ, and there is hope for us and for our planet in the renewal that you promised to bring about one day. That's not to say we do nothing. We need your grace and help and strength, Father, to do what we can in the present, not to take uh, a, a greater weight of the world's resources than we should. We thank you, Father, for your mercies to us and for the privileged place that we enjoy uh, in our present society. Loving Father, help us to use what you put in our hands for good and for the good of our families, our neighbours, uh, our community, the church of God and the people of God. Our Father, forgive us our sins, we pray. Forgive us for those times when we have just taken ungratefully and uh, not been appreciative of all that you've given to us. We pray, Father, for the poor of the earth, uh, which you promise that the, the meek shall inherit the earth. We pray, Father, that we would have compassion and be willing to meet the needs of those whom we can. And so we commend our way into your gracious hands this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.